Yo, good WordPress people. Welcome back to the WP MRR WordPress podcast. Today we have Ahmad Khalifa with us. Uh, Ahmad, super nice to meet you. Tell folks a little bit about what you do online. Uh, what I was super interested to see all the stuff you're working on. Um, some stuff I'm actually not super familiar with, um, but I think that's one of the reasons I like to have guests like you on the podcast to talk to me and maybe some of our audience about stuff that I don't know enough about. So why don't you tell folks a little bit about what you do online? Of course, I'm happy to do it. Well, there are two things that I kind of do online. The main thing that I have, my background is I focus a lot of my work on WordPress SEO. I've been in the industry for over a decade and uh, I've been doing it on the side for a long time and I enjoy it. I love it, part of a community and it's great fun. And then on the other side, I am very vocal about deafness because I am deaf myself and I talk a lot about deaf awareness. And this could be in various sectors of the world. It could be in a workplace, it could be at school, it could be at university, whatever it is. I kind of give examples of what you could do to make things better for other people, make be- better for me. And I share stories and tips and advice on just helping the world to be more deaf aware. And that allows the communication to be as smooth as possible. Yeah, very cool. I am I have background in SEO and content marketing and stuff. So we can chat a little bit about that as well. But I, I, I usually like to start off because I'm selfish. I want to hear and learn about the stuff I don't know as much about. Um, and I'd love to 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 uh, dive into some of the work you you do in the deaf community. But first, I'd actually like to hear a little bit more kind of about your personal background. Um, is, is being deaf something you, you were born with? Is it something that happened when you were young? Was it like an event? Uh, I just like, I guess, like to hear a little bit more about the background so I can like really know kind of what eventually brought you into, you know, working in this community online, really helping others. Yeah, of course. I mean, it makes sense. I, I want to set the tone and make sure you understand the full story. So totally. basically I am pr- classified as moderately to profoundly deaf. And I've been like that since birth. I'm wearing hearing aids as well. And it's under my headphones. And I should wear it all the time, but I'm quite stubborn. I'm just like, nah, don't want to do it. And sometimes it's a personal thing. It's like, I don't feel comfortable with it sometimes or other time, just too much noise, not great. Everyone has their own experience with it. But it's been a challenge all of my life. And it's pretty much a challenge every second of your life. Really, there's no get away from it. You have to live with it and you can't hide from it. But that's the problem. For a few decades, I've been hiding it. I've been just pushing it aside and not taking it seriously. And it's because I've been growing up in a mainstream environment mainstream school mainstream world and that is all i know but then i realized i'm really making things more difficult so when i became more vocal online in terms of website and creating content around seo and content all of these things that's all well and good but then i realized one day i wanted to let go i wanted to come out of my closet if you like and just declare it to the world and it made me realize that if I was more open about it, it actually makes things easier for me and the other person. And it took me a long time to realize it. So by being open about it, I did a video on YouTube a few years ago and I said, here I am, this is what I am. And that kind of kickstarted the whole thing. When I did that, and then I did a few videos after that, the reaction and engagement in the comments has been amazing from people that I know and people I don't know and even the people who know me they didn't know about this at all because I hide it very well so I decided to be more open about it using the help of content so I do it on videos which is captioned obviously and I do it on podcast I put transcript on that and of course I write type my blog post on top of it as well and I do all of that on my website which is hearing me out cc.com cc stand for closed caption i'm a big caption advocate and thankfully the content has been working so well that i get people around the world reaching out to me saying thank you this helped me a lot 
And this is from a person who's deaf. They said, I feel less alone. Or from another person who says, thank you. I've got a student in my class and I want to help that person. I didn't know what to do. Your content has helped me a lot. So it's a really nice thing that people will really take good use of my content and they find it beneficial. And from a selfish point of view, yes, it feels good, but it's very therapeutic. And that's why I enjoy talking about it a bit more. As you say, you want to learn about it. I'm happy to teach you about it and the listeners about it as well. Yeah, uh, it's a beautiful story. I love, I love hearing stories about how people use the internet to kind of become more comfortable in their own skin because there's kind of this... Um, you can put out content and video without necessarily like necessarily being on one one on one with someone just talking about this stuff. And it's, I can put more pressure on situations. Uh, I've been in situations like that too. And being able to like write a blog post about something or do a podcast about something, it creates just that little bit of separation that makes it, I think a little bit more comfortable. Maybe once you've gotten into it, maybe the first time you do, it's a little scary, but once you get into the rhythm of things, um, you know, things Definitely. get, I think Definitely. a little more, a little more comfortable. Cool. Um, one thing we were actually offline, before we started recording this podcast, we were kind of just chatting and, and I mentioned um, the terminology hearing impaired when I was just kind of like asking about, you know, some of the stuff you do. And you actually gave me a little course correction there, which I super appreciated. Uh, but can you talk a little bit about some of the terminology people or I guess terminology you feel comfortable with people using? Obviously, I think people use terminology like I personally use that terminology. I didn't mean anything bad by it, of course, but you know, I think people always prefer people to use certain terminology. I know I prefer people to use certain terminology when they talk about, you know, people maybe of our skin color, right? There's obviously like preferences around these things. So talk a little bit about that. I guess that course correction you you pointed me towards and maybe some of the other terminology that that you and maybe other folks in your community feel comfortable with folks using and that people should should use to describe folks in your community. Yeah, of course. I mean, I know it came from a good place. I don't take any offense right. from it. <laughs> of and course. <laughs> that, I want to clarify that for everyone. It's like, don't worry, I'm not having a go at Joe and say, damn it, man, what are you doing? No, I told him, I, I told that. you to be hard on me. I told you to make sure, <laughs> hey, if you make sure your course correct me, if I, if I say something, hey, maybe isn't isn't the right way to say something. So totally, but appreciate it. <laughs> totally. No, well, I mean, the idea is that people don't realize that the word deaf can mean a lot of things. It's a huge, huge spectrum and it can be broken mm. down to many things. One thing people should understand that there are people who are proud of it. It's not a negative thing. Some people don't see it as a disability. It's a culture. There's a big history around it. And because of that, the terminology of the word impaired implies that there's a negative thing about it. There's a negative connotation to it. And there's a growing movement now people saying we don't want people saying hearing impaired not everyone there will be people who don't mind it sure but it seems to be more vocal now people say hearing impaired is not the right way to say it because it just adds a negative stigma to the word deafness and it's not necessarily mm -hmm. a bad thing and that's what i'm trying to come to terms with and i've gotten better at is i'm accepting it as a good thing because i used to see it as negative so because of that then the idea is you can use the word deaf. Deaf is not a bad word. It's not an insult. It's totally fine. And then there are people who want to maybe break it down. Some people prefer hard of hearing, which technically I also go under that category as well. So I'm happy with deaf and or hard of hearing. Both is fine for me. And then you can break it down even further. You can go late deaf and you can go deaf blind. And then, you know, you really get into the small details about the personality of a person, the deafness, the spectrum. And you will then realize that no two deaf people are the same. Everyone has their own way of dealing with it. Everyone has their own identity. And I think, I'm, I know you talk about that a lot in the podcast about your identity, how you label yourself, how you describe yourself. You know, it's up to you to decide that. Other people don't decide for you. It's the same thing with the topic of deaf and deafness in general. I mean, it is a proud thing and that's what I'm being better at. And that's why I'm being more open and showing my face is that I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of it at all. I'm, I'm being vocal about it because I want to talk about it. So it's great that people like yourself want to learn from, from me about these things. And that's what I'm getting from my content. People want to learn. And I, and I love that. It's really awesome. 
Yeah. Super cool, man. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, but before I forget and before we forget, tell folks also like where you're from in the world because you have a super interesting accent and I want to dig into that too. Well, I've got a very confusing accent. So I am currently <laughs> I didn't say in... That. <laughs> well, no, no, I, I will say that. I'm going to put my hand up and say, dude, I've got a confusing accent. And there's a reason behind that. So I live in Edinburgh in Scotland. And I grew up in the UK. So I grew up in Northern Ireland near Belfast. So I've got that accent thrown in there. Sometimes it comes out, depending on who I'm speaking to. I lived in England and then I lived in Scotland. So I moved around quite a lot to the point where it's easy for me to pick up the accent whenever I go somewhere. And when I speak to a certain someone, like for example, I was speaking to my friend recently from Belfast, the accent just comes out and it's a different accent to what you hear right now. So it's just my upbringing, you know, it's, it's just, I don't know why I pick up accent and then it just get all mixed together. It's a confusing one. My, my cousin called it a Scangle-Irish accent, a Scottish, English and Irish accent. I don't know if that's the word, but that's what they call it. Sounds right. Cool, man. Um, okay. <laughs> Going back to some of the stuff you were talking about earlier, I, I would love to hear a little bit about maybe some of your experiences, either attending online events or trying to, honestly, even independent of events, just trying to use the internet, browse the internet, um, and maybe some of the negative experiences you've had being someone um, who's hard of hearing um, to, to either attend maybe an online summit or um, or watch a YouTube video that doesn't have the right transcripts or captioning or things like that. Um, because I think a lot of, a lot of folks think about <clears throat> accessibility in the, in the grand scheme of things. And I think a lot of folks think of it as something that's not always in their financial benefit to, to add some of these helpful things so that everybody can absorb their content. Um, at least that's what I've seen. If, if I'm just being honest, I think I've, I've gotten that vibe around. I, I'd love to talk a little bit about maybe some of the experiences you've had trying to absorb content online and not really being able to because something wasn't accessible to you. Uh, because I think that story is really important. Um, so anything come top of mind or just like in general or certain areas that you're just like, man, this totally sucks when it comes to accessibility and for people who are deaf. Totally. Um, I think a lot of people can relate to what I'm going to say about access in content. And when I say content, it could be videos, it could be podcasts, it could be a person yeah. speaking on stage, that's a type of content. And they are all challenging in their own way. So if we talk about, for example, videos, or, you know, in terms of either YouTube or even the cinema, and it's a huge problem for me in terms of being able to understand what's going on. When, when someone like me tries to listen to someone, your brain is working extra harder because you are listening extra harder and it requires extra cognitive energy to listen to that person. So for example, we're talking right now, but I deliberately limit the number of calls per day because I know I'll be exhausted from overworking my brain, just trying to listen really, really hard. And that happens for me when I go to the cinema, I just come out from the cinema exhausted because I try to listen and most of the time I don't. And in my time of spending so much money and going to the cinema so many times, I've only been able to understand it once in my life. And that was only when they have got a screening with uh, captions on it. And that was for Star Wars, the last Star Wars um, movie. And it's a problem that is everywhere. It happens everywhere in that when you look at the timetable of when they are like captioning screening in the cinema, it's very limited. And not only is limited, the options are on times of not very social times. So for example, a Tuesday morning or a Thursday afternoon. And they just assume people that can go there. But, you know, like all of us, we have jobs. We want to, we work during the day and we want to be able to go on Friday night or Saturday night. But I've never had that option. So for this occasion to watch Star Wars, I watch it on Sunday night. 
which is okay, but not Friday night and Saturday night. So there's a problem with yeah. that alone with cinema. It's just a big nightmare. In terms of YouTube, it's another story. It's a constant battle against YouTube themselves and the creators to encourage them to yeah. caption the videos. And you don't realize that you get a lot out of captioning videos in terms of getting more people, more engagement, and it's better for video SEO as well because Google can't really see what you're saying in the video, but the uploaded SRT file, which contains the caption, they can read that and they'll understand what your video is about. So that's the yeah. benefit as well. And it's really beneficial for me. So when the people think about auto caption, then they say, oh no, you've got auto caption. Now I, I admit auto caption getting better. Google announced it back in November, 2009, I believe when they first announced it and then people were making a big deal about it. And it was okay and gotten better, but it will never be perfect. People are really frustrated with auto-caption because in the deaf community, it is known as craption, literally, because they're crap. And that's the whole thing. It's just, they're crap. And they're not accurate. They're not easy to follow. And people assume that's enough, but I can promise you from someone who depends on captions, they're not enough. They will not do at all. But you have that as your draft and you can edit it and then make it, you know, work really well. And then podcast is another problem. I, I can listen to some podcasts, but that will depend on audio quality and background noise and also my sanity. If I have the energy, then I, I'll do it. But sometimes I would rather just prefer to read the transcripts. So that's another way of doing it. And again, if you have a transcript, that can be converted into a blog post. And that blog post will be readable by Google. There's so many benefits to it. So it is a constant battle across all of these mediums. Um, I'm trying very, very hard to talk about it and tell people that, FYI, I need it. Millions of us need it. But you will also get the benefit out of it because you'll get more people who can access it. And by the way, it's not just deaf people. There are so many people who will benefit from it. That person can be, maybe has a learning disability or maybe attention deficit disorder. Maybe that person is learning the language and doesn't know your language, but with subtitles or captions, they can follow it. Or maybe like a lot of us, we're just watching the video in silence. And I'm sure we have all done that at least once in our lifetime to watch videos in silence. So having captions just makes sense. It's a constant battle, but hopefully the more I talk about it, hopefully people will understand that it's beneficial for many people as a creator and as a consumer. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of the things you said really rang true with me. We have a YouTube channel um, that Allie on our team has has started and grown. Um, and she's big into making sure all our content is accessible. So we do a lot of, you know, we do captions on all of our videos and transcripts all, you know, we have, we, we get them done through a service. I think it's like rev.com or something. I can't remember the exact service. Maybe that's it, but we get them done there. Um, our podcast has transcripts. If you go to wpmrr.com forward slash podcast and go to the page where podcast is on, we have the transcripts on that page. And also we do a YouTube video. This will be on YouTube. They'll do a YouTube video on every podcast we do. And then the transcripts um, and captioning is also there on those videos. Um, so I really like what you said about how you can expand your audience by doing this as well. Um, because I think that of course, I would love everybody to caption and to do transcripts because it's the right thing to do. And you want to make it like the internet, everybody needs to be able to access everything. And so just based on that, it's important that everybody, if you're doing a podcast, you do transcripts, you do captions. And, you know, with YouTube movies should have captions more accessible to people. I'm thinking like an A, like a an AR. Maybe you, maybe some people like put some, have some goggles that they can watch, you know, with captions on or something. I don't know. But um, I like also the idea of on top of that, this is what you should do because it's the right thing to do. That's not going to get everybody. Let's also add a business benefit to that, which is you're going to expand your audience and you're going to expand your audience 
or of people who are really going to appreciate what you did. Because like if I oh, put yes. captions on YouTube and you come to my YouTube channel and you're like, wow, he, like this channel, WP Buffs, went out of their way to like make content that was accessible to me. Like you're going to have that heightened level of like for my channel. You're not just going to like it. Maybe you're more likely to subscribe, right? Maybe you're more likely to like share my YouTube videos because, hey, you have, you know, this community. I want to share it with my community because it's accessible or your content's accessible. So I think that's really, uh, it's a, that's a really solid way to think about the added cost of doing some of these things, but the return on investment you could also get from it in terms of building your audience, in terms of, you know, putting your content out to to more people. Um, I'd love to hear maybe a little bit also about like, what are like the, I don't know if I want to just say like least expensive, because I, I do want to give people like, you could go and probably spend tens of thousands of dollars making all your content accessible, but that is not possible for every small business. But I think every business should at least be dedicating a small budget to making sure their content is accessible. Um, where are the areas that you see that people can, I guess for like a good return on investment, maybe the somewhat less expensive option, um, where can people go to, and, and like what are the action items, easy action items people can do to make sure their content is as accessible as possible or like the most accessibility bang for their buck. One thing people don't realize that when you think about YouTube, for example, if you upload your YouTube video, then the auto caption will then be created. That auto caption can then be edited manually and then you can just correct it, the grammar, the spelling, all the things that you need to do. And that's it. And that is there for free. Now, of course, for certain videos, if it's quite long, then yes, I, I appreciate that it will take a bit more time to do it. But if it's not that long, if it's a, a short video, then there's no reason why you can, you know, you don't go to the classic studio, you go to the, the subtitle section, you edit it there, and it's free from there. So that's one option that if you're doing YouTube videos, it's there. And also you can download the file and convert it into a text file by using any online converter somewhere. You can download the SRT file, which is what you can get, convert it to a text file, and then that can be your transcript as well. And that's also for free. So, you know, that, that's an option of, uh, there for you as well. One thing I would say, when you get a transcript, make sure you structure it and make sure you treat it like, a, like any article. Put in the heading, put in your bullet points, put in the paragraph and the spaces, images in between and embed videos. Just treat it with the love and respect, the transcript. It's not a copy and paste and then that's it. You, you will get a lot of engagement out of that because it's not just one big long text. So from that, it's free. That's YouTube. You can do it from there to it's free. Cool. If if you if you want to pay for it, you know, you're right. You can use services like rev.com and other places. For short video again, it's fine, but for the long, long videos, the cost will pile up. But the cost will pile up if you use the human generated version. So there's someone there manually doing it for you. But if you can use there's so many artificial intelligence tools out there that can capture new videos and create transcripts. So Rev is one of them. Another one is Otter.ai. Another one that I'm using at the moment called Happy Scribe. They use artificial intelligence to caption your videos and a transcript. And the idea is, just like auto captions, they will give you the draft and then you go in there and edit it and check it with just like you would normally do for any content. And that is done at a, it's much, much cheaper. I think most places it's between... 10 cents a minute or 25 cents a minute for yeah. your content. It's, it's affordable, which is much more affordable than $1.25 that Rev charges for human to do it for you because that's expensive. So you can do it free on YouTube, but then you can also use these AI tools that does it for you at very, very cheap. And then you have all this content that you can repurpose into many ways. And there you go. You have so many different things at your disposal to you put on your website, on YouTube, whatever it is. Yeah, I, I love that advice because it's like, 
it's already created for you and it's just kind of, it's just waiting there for you to use. And it's just something someone may not know about. Hey, when you upload a video to YouTube, that's already created for you automatically. All you have to do is go grab it and download it. I guess adjust like a text file, edit it, watch the video right next to the content. Hey, just like, you know, go back maybe once or twice, just correct a couple things and re-upload it and you're good to go. It probably takes... If you have a 10 minute video, it'll probably take 15 minutes to make sure that's correct, something like that. So it's not an enormous, I wouldn't even say it's a small thing to do. It's a tiny thing to do to make sure that your content's accessible to everybody. So yep. that's, uh, that's really good advice. Would, um, it, I, I think it, it would make it easier. I mean, you say a 10 minute video can take 15 minutes to caption it all. One thing I would say, if you want to make your job easier for you, just make sure the audio quality is really, really good. Because if the audio quality is not great, then obviously the tools will not be able to pick up the words correctly. And that means it will take your time, it will take more of your time to correct it. So just consider that option, you know, like for us two, for example, we've got our microphone and we make sure we're in a quiet environment. You know, that is the basic you can do. I'm not saying you have to have a studio or have acoustic panels around you. If the audio quality is good and and you can speak into the microphone, then you're more likely to get the word come up correctly on the tools that you we've met, we've mentioned. And then you have less chances of editing, less spelling errors, or everything. It will never be 100% perfect. That's one right. thing I can promise you. I promise you that. But it will go a long way if you have good audio quality. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I, honestly, until... 20 seconds ago, I had never connected audio quality with accessibility before. I just had audio quality as a thing. I was like, I, I want to have good audio because it's a podcast, right? And people want to have a good audio. And that was kind of the end of my thinking. But that is super illuminating to me because I just, I never like made that connection. And, and it's, it's obvious, but until someone said it to me explicitly, I hadn't made that connection. So thank you for saying that. The audio quality is so important for accessibility because it allows you know, potentially AI powered tools or auto transcript tools to hear you more easily and to give you a more accurate transcript or captioning and then to, uh, you know, provide it or make it so that you don't have as much time you have to spend to manually go through. Maybe you can get it from like 80% accuracy to 90 seven percent accuracy and you only have a few words to correct as opposed to like a few paragraphs or something so that can make a huge difference yeah yep that makes, that's uh it's, it's very very true and even in the, not just about um high quality transcript and caption i mean the good audio will help me to hear certain things better for some people i will guarantee you that if your audio quality on a podcast is poor i will not even attempt to listen to it but if it's good quality then I will try. Hopefully, I feel okay and it's fine. Then I will attempt to listen to it. So good audio quality, as you say, it can be accessibility for many, many reasons. And at the end of the day, who doesn't love good audio quality? <laughs> yeah. I'm making even another connection here because you mentioned if there's a video or audio that doesn't have good quality, you're immediately going to leave because you need that quality to listen to that audio, that podcast, or watch that video. We all know you, you know, do SEO and, and into analytics stuff. Google takes this thing called bounce rate into account. If you're trying to rank something and someone comes onto your content and then leaves immediately, Google says that as a bad sign. So if your content isn't accessible to everyone, maybe you'll have a higher rate of people like you who come onto this content. You're like, oh, this is like okay audio, but like I know I can listen to it immediately. I'm going back. Hey, that's not good for, again, kind of from a business perspective in terms of making your content accessible to everyone. So I'm making a lot of connections. This is actually a super, wow, enlightening conversation for me. So thank you for bringing that up as well. Um, I'd love to chat a little bit about like accessibility WordPress plugins. I'm not sure if you're super familiar with this area. You're nodding, like maybe you have some knowledge. I've seen some plugins like Accessibi. Um, there are other plugins out there. That's just one that comes top of mind. That what it does is it it'll give you a little um, like button that floats in the bottom corner of your website, and you can click on that, uh, and it gives you a ton of accessibility options. You may not be an expert in all accessibility across uh, you know every uh, you know, uh, nook and cranny of it. Uh, maybe you're more uh, of an expert in the deaf specific, uh, accessibility options, but 
just wanted to know if you've ever encountered a website where you've either like used that or maybe you've been on a website browsing and used that and if it's been helpful to you as a user who needs some additional accessibility options. Well, you're, you're right that web accessibility, it's, it's such a big topic, isn't it? It's such a huge, huge topic that you can get into so many details and you've got experts out there doing that for you. So that's why I will never, ever say that I am an a web accessibility expert because there are so many things that we don't think about in terms of what makes a website accessible. For me, I just focus on anything related to deafness, which means being able to access content most of the time. And I have experimented with these tools that you've mentioned, and I've even attended talks at WordCamps about accessibility just to open my mind to learn more about how screen readers work. And the one thing that I've learned, for example, which can benefit in terms of SEO as well, is how important it is to make sure your images are accessible using the alt text. So if your images are not including any descriptive alt text, then the person who's using a screen reader, or maybe your page is not loading the way you want to, is going to be blank and it's not going to describe to the person what that image is. And on top of that, then Google will not know what that image is supposed to be about either. Now, I think Google's gradually getting better about recognizing an image, but why not make it easier anyway? So, for example, if there is a, an image that you have of a black Labrador running on a field on a rainy day, th- then put that as your alt text. And people will then realize that the more descriptive about your alt text than one, People access it, those who are using screen readers or whatever. And two, Google will be able to read that image. And it might even come up when people search on the Google Images section and then they find that image and then they'll check out your post that way. So again, we're talking about the benefit of uh, of having accessibility. I, I don't want to say you should have benefit because I should get the benefit from it. But at the end of the day, it's a win-win, you know, so... You win as a creator, I win as a consumer, Google will win as, you know, trying to understand what your page is about. Why not consider it? So accessibility is such a big topic, but little things like that can make a difference to a lot of people. Yeah, I I totally agree. I'd be interested to even dive a little deeper into that because talking to you who's someone who has expertise in, in, in deaf accessibility and also... SEO and like on-page SEO stuff, do you run into websites where people are at, because the image alt tag is like a factor of on-page SEO. Not sure it's an enormous factor, probably a pretty small factor, but it's a factor that people kind of know is like, oh, maybe this will help a little bit with my on-page SEO. But I don't think most people know how to use the image alt tag. In fact, I don't think a lot of people know that that's what the image alt tag is for. I knew that. Just give myself a little credit. I know that it's for people, uh, it's for accessibility for people to be able to make sure they know what an image is through something like a screen reader, but it also has some, potentially some SEO impact as well. Do you run into websites where it's like, this is totally the wrong description and people like clearly are using this as an SEO tactic and not a, like uh, a, uh, a something for accessibility. I don't know if that's something you run into as like someone who's in the SEO world and the accessibility world. Well, I can. I've, I have seen it the in two ways. One that she's done over the top, and then the other one they just didn't do anything at all. So over the top is yeah, when blank. obviously yeah. they spam it, they stuff it, they put it just putting in words that doesn't make any sense. So the image example I, I've told you uh, about a black dog. You just write in black dog or a small puppy or big puppy or it just got really really annoying and that is not right it's, you you're actually annoying the people who need it properly done and i've seen that i've seen people kind of abusing it it's a very old school as you thing isn't it keyword stuff in yeah very old school but people do it and then on the other hand then there are people who don't even do anything at all with the images you're right that in terms of on page seo is you know, it is a factor. I'm not going to say it's the biggest, but it's one of many. But why not do it? Because we're going to do everything at the same time. So there are people out there that just upload the image and then they leave it. 
But what people don't think about is image SEO in general, you should have your file name should include the keywords and the description. So don't use the default file name like, uh, you know, JPEG 01264.whatever. You don't use that. Be descriptive and separate the word with dash, not underscore. And that is, that's important. That's one way of making sure that's readable. Then use the alt text when you, when you, uh, upload the images. But even then, before you upload that, make sure you compress the images as well. If they're really heavy, really big, then you're just going to slow down the website and we're not going to go into the topic of site speed. We know site speed is important. But if you have images that are 1,000 pixels by 1,000, but it's only really covering a small space, well, then you're making the job really hard for the browser to render that page. And then you're just going to make your whole page really slow down and it's just not going to help anybody. That's another, that's another factor of, of SEO, but in a way it kind of related to accessibility because the image is not loading properly. It takes ages. The information is not there. As you say, it's all connecting together. You know, accessibility can have an impact on SEO and then vice versa and engagement and Google crawl. It's a win-win. Like I said, it's a win-win for everyone if you take it seriously. Yeah, cool, man. Um, last topic, or I don't know, wrapping up topic. Uh, you mentioned here that you you've spoken at WordCamps before. Um, it looks like you've spoken to WordCamp Europe before, which is like a pretty big deal. I mean, most people listening probably know about the WordCamp circuit. Uh, very sad that we won't have any WordCamps through 2021. Um, but WordCamp US, WordCamp Europe are probably the two biggest WordCamps every year. There's WordCamp Asia, which, yes. you know, is it will be among the biggest, but we're still getting that rolling. Probably 2022, we'll talk about that again. But um, I mean, yeah. So in terms of like, WordCamp speaker, like you're not just a WordCamp speaker, like you speak, you've spoken at one of the biggest WordCamps in the world. Uh, and you're also a organizer um, and you were lead organizer of WordCamp uh, Edinburgh. Uh, and that was, I guess, a few years ago. I'd love to know your thoughts on how the WordPress community can potentially do a better job maybe they've done a great job in all the word camps you've organized and spoken at um but maybe there were a few things you saw maybe word camps can do this a little better to either make speaking more accessible or to make the actual content from word camps more accessible i guess around speaking i'm thinking about like the application process like is that fully accessible i don't know i never thought that much about it until a few seconds ago where I decided, oh, I, this is a great time to ask. And in terms of that content, I know they do they do captioning and transcripts, and but they, there's not always a ton of volunteer effort or funding potentially to get all those videos done. I'd love to hear your thoughts as someone who's really in this world and probably just knows right off the top of their head, oh, we could do this better, we could do that better. Any improvements from organizing slash speaking that you think the WordPress community could make around WordCamps and making everything more accessible? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I love WordCamp. I love attending and I, I love speaking. So I'm really lucky to get to speak at WordCamp Europe. Obviously I would have preferred on stage, but you know, circumstances, it just changes things. Um, yeah. In terms of making things more accessible, one thing that we tried in various work camps, whether I was volunteering or when I was organizing several years ago, is that we try to work out how to make it accessible when the person is speaking. So we know that everything is volunteer run, everything is, you know, budget is going to be quite tight for a lot of things. And that makes things a lot of really, really difficult. So one thing that we experimented with is use a tool called webcaptioner.com and basically it's the live transcript tool where if you are connected with the microphone then it will automatically come up as a live you know captioner on the screen so if you have a screen connect that with your laptop and then you get the microphone hooked up then you could watch the live captioner obviously it's artificial intelligence not going to be perfect but it's not bad 
it's, it's not bad. As long as, again, audio quality is good, the person doesn't speak too fast and just speak clearly and all of these things, like anybody we should do, it's not bad. So that's something that we experimented with, although when we at uh, WordCamp Belfast, we did that. Because we have a certain accent in, in Belfast, it struggled to pick up certain words and obviously it struggled to pick up certain technical or WordPress-related jargons. So it was never going to be perfect, which raises the question about we should have funding in place to make it more accessible because people who are attending, whether you're paying money or you got sponsored or whatever, you know, you want to be able to access it. But I struggled myself at times to the point where sometimes I avoid going to work camp or virtual event because of previous experience and because I know it's not going to be accessible. Um, mm. Yes, they might put it in the whole application form in terms of the ticket system. You know, you talk about you have any accessible needs and that should always be there. But people don't really think about, okay, if it's there, then what can you do? in terms of what if the person really prefers sign language interpreter, well, that costs money. And then if there's enough demand for it, who should pay for that? Because the volunteers can't pay for that. So should it go back to WordCamp Foundation and WordCamp People and Central, whether we should talk about making that available for funding in terms of having it available for people who want live captioner with a human person doing it from virtual or interpreter, whatever. So there's a lot of discussion about that. But the easy thing you can do is attempt to use a tool like webcaptioner.com and hook it to your microphone and have it on a big screen and allow the front seat, for example, to be for certain people you know, who require to be looking at the screen because you can't sit at the back. The other thing as well is what you could do it would be really, really helpful if you could also caption your videos when it goes on WordPress.tv. There are thousands, I think, of videos there. And at a contributor day a few years ago in, uh, in Glasgow, and uh, myself and another person, Claire Brotherton, we attempted to look at, okay, let's have a look at WordPress TV and attempt to caption videos there. And how many are captioned? And I have found out that out of thousands and thousands, less than a dozen were captioned. And if you think about how global WordPress is, you can think about people who are learning English or don't know English, but they can read it. Then you're denying them access to the WordCamps as well, not just people like me. So I would really encourage people to make use of tools like Amara. I think Amara is encouraged a few times by, by WordPress to caption either your videos when it's uploaded on WordPress TV or consider contributing. If you want to contribute to WordPress, go to WordPress.tv and caption videos there. And there is a um, community based around in the marketing, um, make WordPress marketing group. They are talking a lot about subtitles and captions and the discussion there about how can we make WordPress.tv more accessible? Well, it requires a lot of resources and people but every little bit helps. And if you can do that, it would really make a difference for those like myself who, if I don't attend, then at least I can watch it on WordPress.tv, hopefully with captions. Yeah, we um, we threw the WP MRR Virtual Summit recently, and we uh, hired a company called White Coat Captioning to do all our captioning. We got a ton of great feedback from that, both from people who used it and needed it, but from a lot of people maybe people who weren't using it and needing it, just being like, thank you for doing this. I don't see everyone doing captioning. And it was really nice to see that you're making, awesome. uh, you know, your event as accessible as possible. Um, yeah. Thank you. You can just thank Allie for that. She's, uh, she's the one, uh, her and Brian are the ones who push that. So um, shout out to them. Um, I, I really, I've thought about this before, but I like the idea of, because every WordCamp has sponsorships. Like you should have, an accessibility sponsorship. Like someone should just sponsor like the video post-production and maybe like a sign language interpreter to maybe appear in like the bottom corner of our virtual event or something. I don't, I don't know exactly how that would work, but um, to me, that's like a really nice way to like, you know, sponsored by your company and like the, 
corner of every video, like that's good for you. And like, you're also doing a really good service for the community. So I think there's like some, some good business benefit people could get for sponsoring as like, kind of like an accessibility sponsorship. I don't know. What do you think about that? Is that something you think might work? I, I would always consider options of funding. It would make your job a lot easier. If people want to get involved, I would encourage it. Obviously, the, the basic thing is everything I've mentioned and make sure that you allow the option of people giving their feedback about what do they require because there's no point having, for example, sign language interpreters if nobody's asking for it. So just open that conversation, be open and receptive about it. And then if there's demand for people saying, I, I require a caption, and if there's people doing it, then let's put the effort in. But honestly, even if it's one person, then let's make that person feel welcome in WordCamp because that is the ethos of WordPress. That's the ethos of WordCamp is that everyone is welcome. And if we have people sponsoring that, then that's great. I would love to see that happen because I think funding would make a big difference and it would make it a lot easier for volunteers. Totally agree. Um, we did a pre-summit survey and asked people to fill out questions. And a lot of it was kind of about what kind of talks do you want? Like where's your monthly recurring revenue right now so that we can know where you are so we can help you get to the next stage. We didn't actually ask any questions about like the kind of accessibility needs people had. And that was probably an oversight on our part. I'll happy to admit if we didn't do something right that we'll do better next year. So that's something I actually just took a note on. I'm going to shoot that over to Brian Alley and make sure next year we have, we put a little, we put, we, we just make sure we get, put the effort into explicitly asking people, Hey, like what kind of needs do you have? As opposed to being like quick captioning, we don't need to ask anybody. Uh, you probably don't need to ask anybody to do caption. You probably should do captioning, but like yeah. additional things, like what else do you need? Is there anything else you need? Because if you're right, if one person, you know, needs something and it's just makes the events totally unaccessible to them. That's a big, big problem. Um, so dude, Ahmed, thank you for hopping on. This has been super awesome. I always know when we do good episodes because I learn a ton and I'm super excited about them. So I thought this was a, an excellent episode. I usually like to wrap up and have you, uh, tell people, uh, one, like where they can find you online. Uh, and two, if there are any like special landing pages we can send people to. Sure. Well, I've, uh, I've got a consistent social media handles, which is I at, at I am I'm at Khalifa, and uh, I'm sure that will be available in the uh, in the show notes. And uh, really, what I want to offer is for only like a limited number of people at limited time. I've got a page set up that if you want one on one conversation, talk about deaf awareness in anything, whether it's a workplace, events, you know, maybe your videos. If you want to talk about that with me. I'm willing to give you a bit of my time, which I normally charge, but I'm willing to give you a bit of my time to discuss that and how to make sure that you're getting the most out of it and make sure that you are as deaf accessible as possible. So if that is what you want, go to hearmeoutcc.com forward slash bubtastic. Limited time, limited number of people. If that is something of interest, check it out. I'll be right there. Yeah. Very cool. I also have somebody else that I can potentially chat to in 2021 when we throw the WP MRR Virtual Summit uh, Volume 2 or a year or two, I guess. Uh, we may want to get a little extra help when it comes to accessibility uh, and deaf accessibility. So you may be getting an email from me or a Slack message. Um, so cool. Um, last but not least, I always ask you, our guests, to ask our audience for a little iTunes review for us for the show. So if you wouldn't mind asking listeners for a little iTunes review, I'd appreciate it. Guys, yeah, come on now, come on. Let's let's do it. Let's give them love to WPMRR. Let's give them love to Joe and, and the team. We, you got to do it. We can give some love simply by leaving a review on iTunes. It would be so awesome if you can do that. Even I would appreciate it as well. So let's do it. Let's all do it together. Yes, right on. Thank you very much. Uh, if you're leaving a review in the comments, leave something you learned from this episode. Leave a thank you for Ahmed so we can send him a screenshot and thank him uh, for helping us get a little extra review. Uh, if you are a new listener to the show, 
we're at like, I think this is episode 118 or something. So we've got like 117 old episodes for you to go uh, and binge. It's an easy time to sit around and binge Netflix or Hulu. But come on, why don't you binge something that's going to help you grow your business, grow your monthly recurring revenue. Check out some old episodes. Uh, We've got a bunch back there. Um, Oh, iTunes review. If you're leaving an iTunes review, WPMRR.com forward slash iTunes forward you right there if you are on a Mac. If you're not on a Mac... I don't think you can leave an iTunes review unless you have an iTunes account or I don't know how that works. But if you're on a Mac, you should do that. Um, if you have questions for us at the show, Christy and I do like to do our Q&A episodes. WP, uh, no, yo at WPMRR.com is the email address. I got ahead of myself. Uh, shoot us an email. Have any questions? We'll do a live Q&A episode. Uh, we do them every once in a while. We'd love to do another one. Now, WPMRR.com. If you want to see the uh, virtual summit, uh, the talks from the virtual summit, they're all up on YouTube. WPMRR.com. There are a bunch of links there. You can go check out the videos from the 2020 summit and get pumped for the 2021 summit as well. Um, That is it for this week. Uh, We will be in your podcast players again next Tuesday. Ahmed, thanks again for being on. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. 